uh, we can have uh, as enjoyable a year as I, I think back on 1984 was, at least for me. And uh, hopefully we can grow more in our walk with the Lord and uh, be used of Him. This morning I would like to continue in our study in the book of Galatians. And will you turn to the third chapter, Galatians chapter 3. Over the holidays, a real good friend of mine took the plunge uh, in public. He stood up in the front of a church with uh, his girlfriend, his fiance, and uh, he said, I will. And, uh, and now he's committed, and she is too. And uh, I'm sure that they're not going to have any problems with that. I know Al, and... Uh, gotten to know Cindy a little bit and uh, they're a sweet couple and uh, they both know the Lord and and yet that was uh, the easy part wasn't it to go through a 35 or 40 minute ceremony and said I do and I will and he didn't even wilt uh, like my cousin did uh, dad was at the same time the same day he was down in uh, Paoli, Colorado marrying one of my cousins and uh, was it his brother his younger brother, his, his uh, cousin, young fella, um, passed out during the ceremony. He wasn't even best man or, or the groom. And uh, I don't know, maybe he got as close to it as he ever wanted to get. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, when you stand up and, uh, and commit yourself to someone in a marriage, that's, uh, that's the easy part to make the promise, isn't it? Uh, the hard part is continuing on day by day. The hard part is getting up and loving them the next morning when they look like something that uh, you never saw before. And uh, it usually is a mutual affair, isn't it? Well, this, this business of uh, continuing on uh, in dedication and devotion and steadfastness, these, these are virtues that are difficult for all of us uh, to... To exercise in any particular area of, of our lives and it's particularly tragic in in the spiritual realm today there are, seem to be very few young people that are willing to stand up and say I'm a Christian I've committed my life to Jesus Christ and I'm going to live for him and uh, make the decisions about who I'm going to marry and what kind of education I'm going to get and the decisions and the, and, and many other things that uh, God lays before me to make those decisions based upon their commitment to him and his word. In this text today, Paul asks a series of questions, six questions, and it's significant when Paul stops in the middle of a letter and starts asking questions. A question there, uh, or a question anywhere in, in, our, in writings is, is like a challenge to stop Take stock of yourself, reflect on the subject at hand as it affects you personally. And this morning I think it's quite appropriate, the first Sunday of 1985. It's almost as if Paul says, I want you to take the telescope or the microscope and focus in on your life. And each one of these questions is, is like a lens at which we look at ourselves in to see how we stack up, how steadfast are we. Are we having any of the problems that the Galatian Christians were facing and some of them were yielding to and failing? And uh, that's what I'd like to do this morning is look at these six questions. And I hope that you will think about them as they relate to your life and my life. You know yourself better than I do and in a space of 35 minutes or so before they kick me out of this pulpit, I can't, uh, I can't make the applications to every one of your lives. I have to think about it myself. And so let's look at these questions one at a time and to see if we are on track or have we been bewitched, have we been sidetracked, have we stopped or uh, been stymied in our commitment to Jesus Christ. And the message that uh, we're looking at this morning is really one that's focused at Christians, at Christians, those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, these are things that are important for us to analyze in our lives. It's a spiritual matter between us and the Lord. And uh, while they do have an application to unsaved people, 
they are directed to Christians. So let's read these questions over as a whole, and then we'll come back through them one at a time. We're going to look at the first five verses of Galatians chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been openly set forth, crucified among you? That's the first question. Second question, this only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Third question, are ye so foolish? The fourth question, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Fifth question, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? And the last question, he therefore that minister, ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now the first question that we've read in verse 1, I believe is a question that Paul is asking, the first lens at which we look at ourselves to focus in on our spiritual life is this what kind of an attitude do you have towards God or we could rephrase it this way I want you to focus in on the big change that has occurred in your life as a Christian occasionally because we're weak because we're human we collapse we fall down we make mistakes don't we and if you look around you and most of us are better at analyzing we're better experts at picking apart other people than we are ourselves uh, we can look at other people we know who are Christians and we can say boy have they ever gone downhill boy that person really made a bad move right? it's not quite so easy to do it to ourselves but this is just like uh, the question that the doctor asks you when you go in for your yearly checkup you know, has, has there any big changes taken place in your physiology this year? You know, have you, um, are you generally more tired than you were back in January of 84? Are you generally out of gas, out of steam? Um, do you feel any different in general? He asked you a general evaluation question. You know, how do you feel? Any difference? Any changes? Any big changes? And usually when there's a, a fairly big difference in the way we feel, Physically, it's an indicator to him of specific problems that would cause those changes. And this is the kind of question that Paul is asking the, 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 uh, the Galatian Christians. He says, take stock of your spiritual life. Um, he says, he, he prefaces the question with the statement, oh foolish Galatians. Obviously, they have changed. Obviously, there has been a drastic change in their lives. What was the change? He intimates it in the question. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? It's almost identical to the question that he asks in chapter 5, verse 7. He says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? In other words, Paul is getting them to think about what's happened to them. Who are you letting influence you? And what in the world have you allowed yourself to be led down the garden path into? You've changed. You're not the same as you were. Now ask yourself that question this morning. Can you look back in your spiritual life over the last year? Or since you got saved? And has there been a drastic change? Perhaps at first you were excited, you were committed, you were witnessing, you were studying, you were fellowshipping, you were involved. What about now? Has there been a drastic change? And if it is, who caused it? it is, is it really somebody else's fault or is it really your fault and you're passing it off on somebody else? Or has, is it really somebody else's fault and, and, and because they're mistaken, they're teaching you the wrong thing, they're giving you the wrong advice, and you're listening to it, and it's affecting you for the worse. That happens all the time to Christians. Who do you listen to? Who hinders you? Who has bewitched you? All right? And uh, lots of times we don't have to listen to anybody. We just listen to our own heart and it bewitches us. <coughs> Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked and who can know it? We've got to be careful about doing what comes natural. 
because natural is sinful right we're born sinners naturally we, we do what's wrong Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that you before in your unsaved lives you did by nature that which was wrong you were children of wrath by nature you, see, you just can't go along every day and expect to stay on a spiritual level you will always degenerate if you just go along day by day you've got to grow you've got to advance you've got to keep plugging away these people had listened to somebody and uh, and and he says somebody has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth the word obey there in the Greek is um, is really the word for listen to and you, you parents know how closely related those two verbs are to listen to is the same thing as to obey right you tell your child to do something and they don't do it because they don't hear you you see they don't listen they block you out right that's disobedience you know unless you have you know said it while the vacuum cleaner was running or something and they couldn't hear you but these people had stopped listening they had and it's in the middle voice which in the Greek has the, the implication that it's a personal choice it's personal reflective action you do it out of your own interest right they had uh, before excuse me who has bewitched you that you should not yourselves of your own energies obeyed the truth you stopped listening unfortunately this happens in marriages yeah. before you were married you could hardly get off the telephone right people go to great expense to talk to their fiance separated by miles over the telephone right running up the bill right and then when you're in the same house the TV's going, the radio's going, you're out in the garage, she's in the kitchen, you're in the bedroom, she's doing this, never communicating. And it's easy. You, know, you get tired of talking, you get tired of dealing with your little problems, you get tired of being long-suffering. And, and I know how, how I struggle with it. We all do. If you're married, you struggle with it. I don't know of anybody <laughs> that doesn't. Maybe some of you uh, could teach me a few things. Right? But we, we tend to stop listening, don't we, in our lives. Children stop listening to parents, thinking uh, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, All they want to do is keep me from having fun, right? When you stop listening, you stop obeying. The two go hand in hand. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, somebody has influenced you Christians somehow so that you no longer put out the energy yourself, middle voice, to listen to the truth and I have seen that happen it's it's an un, it's an unfortunate and sad fact that in our particular church there seems to be a cycle of people you have people that come for a few years and then they're gone and then other people start and they go for a few years and they're gone right it's sad very few start and continue <laughs> right why because they listen to people lots of times that discourage them uh, people like to gossip you know and that discourages that that cuts down right um, people don't want to can put out the continuous effort for teaching for fellowship for involvement and that's a sad thing it happened to the Galatians and it happens today all the time in this first Sunday of 1985 I could only encourage you to try a little harder to look at your life and to say, look and, and, and evaluate where have I stopped? Where have I let down? Where have I quit trying? Where have my energies dissipated? Right? And, and, and strive a little bit harder. Go, go forward some more. These people, Paul says, it didn't have an excuse. He says, you have stopped obeying the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been openly set forth and crucified among you. Christ wasn't crucified in Galatia. He was crucified in Palestine. What is Paul talking about? The last or second last verse of the previous chapter says, I am crucified with Christ, Paul says. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. How was Christ crucified in Galatia? He was crucified in the life of the Apostle Paul. 
Paul, the apostle, a decent living, a consistent, steadfast, active, committed Christian lived in their midst. And they had that example to follow and they had quit listening to him. They had forgotten his words. The advice, the teaching, the encouragement, the exhortation, out of mind. You see? And this is just like a rebellious child to the parent. Somehow, it's, it's natural to, to resist, to rebel. As we grow up, we think we made it. You know, we think we're mature. We think we can handle it as Christians. And therefore, we begin to get a little cocksure. And we quit listening to people who are a little more mature in the faith and know what the Word of God says. And we start to live our own little lives. We quit obeying the truth. That's bad. And that's what happened to them. In spite of the fact that they had a good example to follow, they quit trying. They quit listening. That's the problem. And it happens today. The second question that Paul asks in verse 2 is, is like another lens. He puts it in front of them. He says, okay, now, not only do I want you to look at what has happened to you, the big change in your life, that you stopped doing something because somebody hindered you, I want you to look now at how did you get saved in the first place? The question is this. Paul says, teach me something. Right? Here I am writing to you. I'm teaching you something. You tell me something. I want to know. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm ignorant. Show me. This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit through the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? This isn't an irrelevant question. It's the crux to the whole issue. How did you get saved? Focus back on that for a minute. He's not saying, well, um, you know, where was the building and what was the actual date on the calendar and, you know, who was there and what happened here and, you know, what was going through your mind. That's not the question. He's not saying, did you receive the Spirit, you know, by being slain in the Spirit and speaking in tongues and doing this or that or some other thing. No, he's saying, what is the mechanism whereby God saves people? How did He save you? How did you receive the Spirit? I think all of us, when we, when we think back on it, if we are all familiar with the Scripture, and we should be at least on salvation Scriptures, if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, have to admit that everything from God is a gift. We get nothing from God without it being a gift. In Acts chapter 10, verses 43 and to 45, we have an episode that stresses this fact. People get the Holy Spirit as a gift, and not through any effort on their own. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Peter said to the, these Christians up in Caesarea, to him, that is to Jesus Christ, all the prophets give witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word, and they of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't that they put themselves in a, in a certain frenzied state of mind, or there was a, a certain a specially effective preacher there on that occasion. That wasn't how they received the Spirit. They received the Spirit as a gift. Now, why, does, why, is, Peter, why is Paul stressing this? Because it's stressed in the scriptures. Because it's the crux of the, the salvation question. And it's not just the crux of the salvation question. But because God works this way in salvation, He always also works this way in the Christian life. These, these Galatians have stopped. There's been a big change. And it has to do with the way they were saved. They're not living the same way they were saved. And God expects us to live the same way we were saved. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. And how did we do that? You received Him by faith, right? We believe in Jesus Christ and He, and he gives us the gift of eternal life. As you, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. So walk ye in Him. That means pull up your bootstraps and do your very best. Work your little heart out for Jesus Christ. No, it doesn't. It means you've got to keep living 
in the same frame of mind, the same attitude towards God, the same view of yourself, the same approach to the scriptures, everything. Just as you got saved by believing in God's promise, written in His Word, realizing your helplessness, knowing that the only way you could be saved is by dependence, faith in what Jesus did, so you walk the same way, living on the promises of God, realizing your inability to keep the commandments of God and to live for Him because we have a flesh that fights against God. See? I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. This is one of the other questions he asked. But the point is, is that he says... Think about it. How did you get saved? Did you receive the Spirit of God, ek, works of the law, out of the works of the law, as a result of keeping the commandments of God? No. By the works of the law is the knowledge of sin, Paul says in Romans 3.20. Not salvation. Or through the hearing of faith. And that word hearing is fascinating. It's, it simply refers to the message that you hear or the thing that is preached. Did you get saved by doing works of the law or by the message of faith? That is, the message in which you put your faith when you hear the message. Obviously, it's the second procedure. It's all of grace. It's all of faith. Romans 6.23, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5.15, we receive the gift by grace. Romans 5.16 refers to justification as the free gift. Romans 5.17, they who receive the gift of righteousness. Ephesians 2.8, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now those are salvation scriptures that parallel the fact that the Spirit too is a gift. You don't work for the Spirit. You don't receive the Spirit Himself, as a, as a result of any effort on your part, it's, it's God simply gives it when the circumstances are right. That's important, because it leads on to the next problem, as we've indicated. The third question that Paul asks in verse 3 is, are you so foolish? Are you so foolish? You know, all of us are fools in some area. I'm, I'm a fool when it comes to mechanics. I mean, I'll admit it. You know, I, I can't fix hardly anything. <laughs> and uh, it's a good thing I have brothers in the Lord that, that uh, you know, have those gifts that are willing to minister to my needs that way, and hopefully I can uh, wield a hammer for your benefit sometime or give you one, all right? Uh, we all have needs, right? And, uh, and these people were fools in the area of Christian living, not so much in salvation. They were saved. They were wise in that respect. They had been made wise unto salvation in the scriptures. But they were fools as far as how to live the Christian life. Maybe you are too this morning. I don't know. I think all of us have to admit in some area we are. The question here is, is tied up in the word that Paul used for foolish. Are you so foolish? And not a toy means not understanding. Uh, trench. A Greek scholar says that this word refers to a moral fault lying behind an intellectual deficiency. In other words, you don't understand something and therefore you just live and make moral choices and, and, and behave ignorantly because you don't understand something in your mind. Let me give you an example. Uh, today, you know, in our society, our our society is shot through with immorality, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, uh, bestiality, you know, all the perverted, you know, kinds of sex. And why do people fall into these immoral and amoral activities? Why do they act such? Is it not because they don't really know, they don't understand what they're doing to themselves? They don't realize that there is a God with eyes that sees them and that they are killing themselves and that they are just heaping up judgment to themselves in the last day. See, their actions are caused by their the way they think. And that's, that's the implication of this question. Are you people so foolish? Are you living this way in your Christian life? And what, what were they doing? Do you remember what the Galatians were doing? 
They were listening to false teachers. They were trying to live the Christian life just like the Jews in the Old Testament tried to do it, you know, by keeping laws and ordinances and, you know, and doing things. That's not how you live the Christian life, by just doing in your own power and strength. That's the whole problem here. They were trying to live for Jesus Christ. They were trying to keep God's commandments. Is that what you've been trying to do? It's a common problem today. There's a lot of foolish Christians today that don't realize that that's not how to live the Christian life. You don't live the Christian life by trying to please God. Now that sounds radical, doesn't it? But that, maybe that boggled your thinking a little bit. I hope it did. Because it, it's um, basic to, to how God really wants you to live the Christian life. It's not that he doesn't want you to please him, and it's not that God doesn't expect us to keep laws. It's the method in which we do it. Are you trying? Are you trying? See, that's the whole thing at stake. Are you so foolish? People are atheists. They believe or disbelieve in the existence of God, and therefore they become humanists and barbarians and animals. And that's the way... That's why our society is going downhill because of the way they think. This is only another illustration of the point. Let's go on and, and we'll see how Paul applies it. In the second part of verse 3, he asks the next question that really explains this question, explains why they were being so foolish. He says, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Do you see what he's He's relating the, next, the previous two questions and bringing it right home now to the real crux of the problem. He says, you people have really changed. Why don't you look at, go back and think about how you got saved. How did you get saved? Nobody gets saved today. And nobody ever has got saved, according to the Bible, by trying to be saved. By approaching God in their own physical power and their own emotional <coughs> and so-called spiritual strengths and, and ethics and morals and goodnesses. No. God flatly rejects that kind of approach to him. He says, you come to me through Jesus Christ and I'll accept you. And the only way a person comes through Jesus Christ is admitting, look at it, I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm helpless, God's going to kill me, he's going to send me to hell for eternity, there's nothing I can do to get out of it. Jesus did the only thing that, to get me out of it. He, he, he took my punishment. He satisfied God's holiness because God hates sin. You see, we get saved by faith in, in what another person has already done for us. And you live the Christian life the same way. He says, people, you began in the Spirit. Now, are, do you really think that you can be perfected in your Christian life, that you can be made mature and complete and arrive in the flesh? You see the issue at stake here? Do you become a, do you start the Christian life in the power of the flesh? No. You can't finish it that way either. You can't continue that way either. If you start by faith, you've got to continue by faith and finish by faith. Look at Galatians chapter 5. There's a couple of very appropriate verses here that explain why we can't do it this way. Why you cannot be perfected by the flesh. Why your trying simply doesn't accomplish anything. Look at verse 17. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would or the things that you desire. What does the flesh do? It, it reeks out in verse 19 adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, all kinds of uncleanness and fornication, sexual immorality. If you try, you will fall flat in your face. And you know, there's documented evidence that religions produce this kind of thing. Mormonism has always had the problem of polygamy. It's sexual uncleanness. Roman Catholicism is shot through according to documented literature, with all kinds of sexual uncleanness because it's a religion of the flesh. They try in their own power. You see, and There's all kinds of people that think they're okay, but uh, perhaps they don't perform physical acts of sexual uncleanness, but their eyes are continually leading them into the same kind of thing. You see, uh, 
fleshliness fights against the spirit and that's why in our own fleshly ability we simply cannot be perfected I strive with this all the time it, it's a continual fight to live a clean life you've got to depend on the Spirit of God for victory or you'll fall flat in your face and you never in this life get better and better and better in your own strength you just don't do it the the challenge here in, is in verse 5 if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit the the question could be rephrased this way since we live in the spirit see we got saved and God placed us he baptized us into the Holy Spirit just as he baptized us into Jesus Christ just as he baptized us into the body of Christ baptize is just a big word for put he put us in the Holy Spirit. He put us into Christ. He put us into the body, that is the church. And that's where we are. And since we live in the Spirit, since that is true, God expects us to walk in, in His power, not in our own fleshly power. And that's a radical, it's the difference between being victorious and being, being defeated. It's the difference between satisfying God, pleasing Him, and wrecking our spiritual lives. These people had started out by faith and there had been a radical change. As baby Christians, somebody came in and says, hey, it's not good enough to believe you've got to keep the laws of Moses. You've got to work like a dog. You've got to try harder. You've got to keep the commandments and the ordinances and the rituals and the ceremonies. You've got to do all these things to please God. And Paul says, hogwash. You don't have to do anything. You have to depend on the Spirit, and then you can do it, but not in your own power. He says, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now made perfect and complete in the flesh? No way. The next question in verse 4 it looks toward the future. He says, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? And this word suffered is misleading because when we talk about suffering, we always think about somebody beating you over the head with a sword or a hammer or something. And that's not the implication of this word at all here. It, it's a valid translation, but the word actually means, have you been acted upon, have you received, have you been blessed in so many things in vain? It's a positive thing here. Have you been the recipients of the grace of God and of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and of the labors of the apostles and of the examples that have been given to you? Have you been the recipients of all of these things in vain? The question that he's, he's focusing in here, he's putting another lens in the, in the microscope and he says, now just look at what God really expects. You know, God's got a great investment in you. Now, it's only reasonable that you respond a certain way. Right? You can uh, go to university today. The government will help you. They'll invest a great amount of money into your education. You can get loans and bursaries. And, and uh, some of them are forgivable, but it's getting harder and harder to get those kind. Right? You can get loans where you pay them back later. Right? So the government invests in you money in you to get an education so that you can be trained to go into the workforce to then produce something else towards gross national product to help the economy increase but when the government invests something in you you can bet your soul on it that uh, they're going to expect a return on their investment the banking institution would fall flat on its face if uh, if they said uh, you know you don't have to pay us back we don't really require a, a return on our investment We'll just give you this money. Go ahead, use it. And if you feel like it, pay it back. That's the way a lot of Christians look at God. They say, thanks, God. You know, I got my fire insurance policy from hell, and now I'm saved. Yippee-doo. I can live like I want. See? Without realizing that they have been the recipients of a great deal of investment on God's part. And, and, they're, and they're wasting it. They're not giving it any return. What are you doing? Are you, uh, are you giving God uh, anything? He gives very explicit instructions as to what kind of a return he expects. 
for what he has invested in us and for what we have received. He has given us eternal life. He has given us salvation. He's given us his spirit. He's given us the church. He's given us his word. He's given us promises for the future and promises for this present life that really work if you live by faith in them. He's given us all kinds of things. And he says... In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable service. It's, it's what is expected in the return part of the investment relationship. God invests all this in you, and it's only rational. It's only reasonable that a Christian who has been the recipient of all these great things would say, Lord, I belong to you. I'll give you my body and my soul and my talents, my time, my energies, and I'll live for you on the job, in the home, wherever. I'm yours. And don't forget it. It's not an option. It's a command. Present your bodies. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15, Paul puts it this way. He says, Christ died for all, for the purpose that they who live should not henceforth live to themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. The love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. You see, what God has done for us requires response on our part. And it just, it's a vain life. Can you imagine living the rest of your Christian life pleasing yourself? You're going to end up just as happy as all the unsafe people that spend their lives living for themselves. You're going to end up with zilch. There's no better way to be a discontented Christian than to live for yourself. You've got to live for Him if you want to be blessed. And that's a choice that each of us, a clear choice that each of us have to make. The last question we find in verse 5 also looks toward the future. Paul says, He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Or by the message in which you, which you hear and in which you put your faith? The question here is, how do you continually benefit? Focus the lens on your spiritual leaders for a minute and on other good examples of Christians that you know. And look at them a little bit and see how they live their lives. Do they live their lives by working their hearts out, by trying their hardest to please God? Or are they men and women of faith? Faith meaning reading the Bible, taking its promises literally, and, and living their lives based upon the reality of what God says He's going to do. Are they men and women of faith? Do they minister to you by the Spirit or do they do it by the works of the law? Do they depend and live by the Holy Spirit? That's why Hebrews chapter 13 verse says, says that we are to um, my mind goes blank at the most in inopportune times. It says, remember them who have the rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God. Notice carefully what he says. Whose faith follow. You see, one of the fundamental requirements of a spiritual leader of any sort is that they demonstrate faith to the rest of the Christians that are looking at them. When you look at me, do you see me... Um, struggling like a, a maniac to get worldly securities? Or do you see me and others spending my time doing what God wants me to do and letting Him worry about my future? You see, that's, that's, the, kind of, that's the kind of question that Paul is asking here. You know, what, what kind of example are, are the people that you're to be following giving you? What kind of life do they live? Look at them for a minute. How are they doing it? Are they doing it in the power of the flesh? By works of the law? Or are they doing it by the Spirit? In faith. The hearing of faith in the message. So it's time to wake up. It's, it's time to take a real good analysis of ourselves. These questions are serious. They're helpful. It's not 
necessarily a slap on the wrist. To the Galatians it was because Paul says, you people blew it. <laughs> you are fools because you have blown it and you have been misled. You have changed. You're trying in your own power. You're forgetting the Spirit of God. You're not listening to the promises. It's not hearing a faith that matters to you. It's efforts of the flesh in works of the law. And, you, and you're not getting anywhere. You're not following in the steps of me, Paul says. And you're not pleasing God. To us, it's merely a challenge. There's something to bear in mind through 1985. Are we going to go through this year, perhaps for the first time, with a greater sense of awareness that pleasing God doesn't mean working like a dog to be a good person and to keep the commandments found in the Bible? I hope so. I hope so. And uh, that'll be the, the best way to approach 1985 that could possibly uh, be followed. And uh, I hope that you will uh, not be a bewitched believer or a sidetracked saint as these people were. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your gracious provisions, your instructions to us. We have uh, benefited from this time of reflection, questioning, self-analysis, Father, just help us to, uh, to learn to labor in faith. That is, to enter into rest by doing the kind of work that you expect of us, and that is believing your promises. And when we believe your promises and act accordingly, your Spirit takes the work out of it and does the work for us and accomplishes something. Help us to remember this lesson all year long, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.